That is absolutely so true. And I love that song. I, I'm, I, I do. I, I love our praise team. And I know I say this all the time when we're all together. But they just do a great job. And I love them. And they, they worship. They lead us in worship and praise, which is a tremendous weapon, by the way. I, um, I mentioned it this past week. I did a little short broadcast uh, from the office at, at home. And uh, I mentioned to you that the purpose of praise and worship, one of the tremendous purposes of praise and worship is to stick a dagger in the, in the enemy's heart. In Psalm 149, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking But in Psalm 149, it says that, uh, that we're to carry a two-edged sword and with the high praises of God on our lips. And it's talking, Psalm 149 is talking about defeating the enemy and whipping the enemy and tearing the devil up. And you do it through praise and worship. It just really, um, I mean, it, uh, the, the two-edged sword, of course, is the word of God, cuts going in, cuts coming out. And the, uh, the high praises of God on our lips are just like, uh, they're just nuclear. You know, the Bible is just a nuclear weapon against Satan. So, hey, you get a little discouraged this week or you find yourself languishing a little bit or being a little flat, uh, just uh, go to YouTube, uh, pump on some Freedom River Church video. If you can't find that good stuff, you might have to slum on down to Elevation or Bethany or one of those, and uh, that'll be all right. I mean, it'll, it'll still work for you, and just uh, praise the Lord. Let me share with you today uh, for those that are here with us and some that have been watching, that watch all the time, you know, we've been in a series called The Hurt Locker. And in this series, it's dealing with the fact that we all have hurts and that those hurts affect our relationships, our life, the things we think about, the things that motivate us. Uh, our, all of our life and all of our relationships are, are affected by what is, uh, what is in our hurt locker. The, the things that are in our hurt locker obviously are, are pains and anxieties and, and issues that have happened in our life that have never been cleansed, that have never been handled properly because most of us don't know how to handle real hurt properly. And we tuck it away, we, we, we put it away, and our hurt locker is in our heart, uh, tragically, and it just holds these pains and these hurts. And... Many times, I know you've been surprised at yourself how you respond to certain things. Uh, you may even think to yourself, why, why did I get so upset about that? That wasn't anything to, that wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, or people that you're with, you know, they look at you and you just go off on something and it's like, come on, settle down, man. It's not that, you know, it's not that bad. Well, what causes things like that? Well, it's what's in the hurt locker. And, and I'm going to be sharing uh, when we all get back together, which I believe will be very soon. Uh, I'll share the second message in the series. The first message was Everyone Hurts, and uh, we've, we've shared both of those messages. But the next message in the series is called The Hurt Whisperer. And the devil is the hurt whisperer. And, and whenever you have a hurt, uh, the devil is at every funeral. He's at every car accident. He's at every tragic overdose. He's at every suicide. He's at every um, hurt and pain and uh, devastation in life. He, he's just there. He's at every one of them. And you know what he's doing? He's whispering in our ear about how much we can't trust God, about why did God let this happen? about all these terrible accusations against God. And if he loved you, he wouldn't do this. I thought you said you were a Christian. Where's God now? All of these kind of things. And, and he takes advantage of these devastating times in our life in order to whisper things into our spirit so that we will begin to mistrust God or we'll separate a little from God or we'll, we'll become suspicious of some things that that God would do and why he didn't do it. And in other words, we would erect somewhat of a wall and we'd put these things in our hurt locker and they would continue to hurt until they finally get healed. Uh, whenever that might be, it might even be years from now before these things are dealt with. But anyway, so the message will be about that. It's about the hurt whisper, and I'm going to have several examples from the Scripture, and it's going to, you're going to get to see exactly how he does it, what he does. It's just amazing. It's really simple and easy to see in the Scripture. But um, one, of the, one of the people that I'm going to use as an example is Simon Peter. 
Now, I'm not going to share the whole message and all of that kind of stuff, but I do want to share something that I think will be very beneficial to you just by itself, uh, but really, especially in relationship with that hurt whisperer message, because you'll have some insight into Peter and to his response to Jesus and why he responded so drastically. And it's just one of those major events that happens to Peter between Peter and Jesus. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, um, Jesus uh, is, is, uh, has his disciples and he's very clearly, uh, let, me, let me put this up on the screen for you. Yeah, I keep forgetting to do this. This is Jesus speaking and he's speaking with his disciples. And he's, and he's very clearly identifying to them that he's going to, to go away, that he's going to be crucified, that he's going to go to heaven, that he's going to prepare a way for them. And this is really a very encouraging word to the disciples because this is what he's been saying all along. This is certainly not anything new for them. And uh, let me just read the passage. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. So, you know, here he is saying, okay, guys, it's time for me to accomplish my purpose. I'm going to, I'm, we're going to fulfill this thing. This is why I came and this is what's going to happen and it's going to be tremendous. Well, look at verse 22. Look at how Peter responds to this. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Now imagine this. Here's Peter who hears this tremendous word. All the rest of the disciples hear this tremendous word. None of them respond this way. But Peter pulls Jesus off and Peter says, Let me talk to you about what you just said because this is not going to happen to you. And Peter basically just confronts Jesus about what he just told them about dying and going to heaven. And look what Jesus did, the very next verse. But he, but Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So can you imagine being in a discussion with Jesus and him calling you Satan? Uh, knucklehead maybe you know I could probably I could probably agree with that but for Jesus to look at you and call you Satan that would be a very disturbing thing wouldn't it well what what is it that Jesus was doing there well it, Jesus, we all know there are spiritual battles around us all the time there are spiritual entities around us all the time there's spiritual warfare going on all the time. The Bible talks to us about, uh, about wickedness in high places and that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand. So we're aware that, that spiritual issues are going on around us at all times. And here's Simon Peter, and Jesus has given him this wonderful message and this very encouraging, I'm going to heaven. And I mean, Peter, Peter this is going to be the complete of everything I've, I've said. This is why I'm here. Once I go, the Holy Spirit's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to fill up your life. You're going to become one of the preeminent apostles of, of the kingdom of God, man. You're going to preach and 3,000 people are going to get saved. You're going to be a tremendous, you're going to tremendously be used by the Holy Spirit. That's what should have come across to Peter, but that's not what Peter heard. Peter heard an entirely different message and he responded from his hurt locker. And Jesus, seeing the hurt whisperer who is actually standing behind Peter, whispering in Peter's ear, tell him this will never happen. You can't let this happen. This is never... If he goes away, no one will believe in you. No one will like you. You won't be the star. You won't, you'll be a nobody again. That's the whisperer. Peter didn't see the devil. Jesus did. Jesus turned and looked and saw Satan whispering in Peter's ear. And Jesus wasn't talking to Peter when he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He was talking directly to Satan who was whispering in Peter's ear. What was the issue with Peter? Well, it's very interesting, and, and it's a very interesting understanding of, of Peter's life. You know, Peter was a fisherman. Nothing wrong with being a fisherman. Fish, being a fisherman is a very noble business. But, it, but to be a fisherman is to be a commoner. I know that you're aware that Jesus was Jewish, that his disciples were Jewish, and that he lived in a Jewish society. 
And so all the cultural issues and all of the, the laws and so forth that, that ruled all of their lives had to do with, uh, with Jewish culture and the way they did things. Well, in the Jewish culture, they had a hierarchy of, um, of jobs. Uh, uh, certain things held high esteem and certain things were common jobs and so forth. And of course, we all know that we men, we get our self-esteem from what we do for a living. It's, that's why it's very important for us, for everybody to know where we work and the higher level we are, the more we're esteemed, you know. At least that's the way it feels in us. But, well, the Jewish custom, the Jewish society was not much different from that, except they did have levels, and certain people and certain trades were looked at in certain ways. Well, to be a rabbi, to be a teacher, uh, was the highest level of Jewish society. It was, it was what every Jew, male uh, in, in the Jewish society uh, really strived to be. They wanted to be a rabbi. This was a very highly regarded um, occupation in life. Well, uh, of course, in order for this to happen, there had to be some education. And here was what happened just in a nutshell with the Jewish education system. When, in the Jewish society, when a child was six years old, they, uh, the child went into school and stayed there until they were 10 years old. And this school usually happened at the temple or some uh, gathering place, and a, a scribe or a rabbi, someone taught those children, and they used the Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they used the Torah to teach them everything, spelling, reading, um, math. They used it to teach everything. Well, when a child became 10 years old, if, uh, if, they, uh, just, if they exhibited uh, special expertise and they appeared to be very smart and they, could, and, and they can learn these things and they, they, they're really great students and they have a, an opportunity to grow more educationally, then they'll move up to the next level of, uh, of school in, in, in Judaism, which happened with 11-year-olds through 15-year-olds, and it was the second level. If they didn't if they didn't display the fact that they were the best of the best uh, at 10 years old, you had no more school. That was the ending of all, the end of all schooling, and you went to work in the family business. Whatever your family did for a living, you went, and you went back, and you worked with dad, and you learned the family business, and you did the family business, and that was the end of your education. Of course, no chance to be a rabbi if you end your education at 10. Well, if you're the best of the best, they put you in the next level of schooling. And in the next level of schooling, you not only are taught out of the Torah, you're taught out of the entire, the entire Old Testament. Uh, not, not just Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but Genesis through Malachi. And it involved a lot of memorization. And many of the students could quote verses from anywhere. They could quote the whole Old Testament or books of the whole Old Testament. And when they were asked, they had to quote certain books at certain places. They had to know it. They were, they were trained and taught for until they were 15 years old, uh, the book of the law and uh, the book of all the Jewish customs and all of these things. It was very high level. Well, at 15 years old, if you were the best of the best at 15, then you got to move to the next level. If you weren't the best of the best, then your education ended when you're 15 years old and you were sent back to the family business to work in the family business with Papa and, and, and all of those things. Noble thing, great thing, nothing wrong with that. But, of course, you were a commoner. Uh, you, you, didn't, you weren't the best of the best of the best. Well, if you were at 15, if you were the best of the best of the best, then you petitioned a rabbi. Rabbis in this day were roving teachers. They were, they were teachers that taught all types of skills and understandings. Some of them were religious. Some of them weren't religious. Some of them were tradesmen, and they taught certain trades, and they saw, taught certain skills. Well, depending on uh, what you wanted to learn, if you were the best of the best of the best and you qualified, then you could uh, appeal to a rabbi that did things that you were interested in doing or wanted to learn, and if that rabbi uh, who would question you and grill you and rake you over the coals and rake you over the fire because he, the only thing the rabbi is interested in is, uh, is this kid smart enough to make it? Uh, will this kid represent my teachings well? Can this kid become like me? Uh, can this kid spread my yoke? Because the, the teachings of the rabbi, were, it was called their yoke. 
And, and so the rabbis then would choose based on who they thought could bear their yoke. Well, uh, to make a long story short, here, here's, the, here's the deal with Peter. Uh, Jesus is walking down the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is, Jesus is, is looking out as he goes down and he sees Peter and Andrew, Peter's brother, Peter and Andrew, and they're on their father's fishing boat. And they're, and they're, they're at least 16, 17, 18 years old, maybe young 20s even. What does this mean? Well, if they're on the boat and they're not attached to another rabbi, that means they didn't make the cut. That means they're B-teamers. That means they're not somebody, they're just anybody. And Jesus looks at them, and Jesus says, come follow me. And the Bible says, immediately they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Yeah, they didn't even say bye to Papa. Uh, they just dropped the nets and started going with Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus was the hottest young rabbi on the circuit. Jesus was the latest and greatest. Everybody wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. Why, they said this Jesus could do miracles. He taught and thousands of people would pack out the mountainside to hear him speak. He was the greatest. And here he was saying to Peter and to Andrew, I want you. I believe in you. I think you're the best of the best of the best, and I want you to come, and I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you what I know so that you can do what I do so that you can be what I am. And this appeal to Peter, who felt like a nobody, who said, I didn't make it. I'm not smart enough. I thought I would make it, but why can't I ever make things like that? I'm a B-teamer. I'm second class. I'm a collection of of." of not enough, you know, I just don't have enough. Well, that's what he put in his hurt locker. That's what was in there. I'm a nobody. Nobody wants me. I'm not good enough. And here's Jesus looking at him and saying, you're good enough. I believe in you. Come follow me. And he and Andrew immediately followed Je follow Jesus. And then Jesus walks right on up the sea and he comes to another couple of guys named James and John, and they're in the fishing boat of their father, Zebedee. Well, they're not following a rabbi either. What does this mean? It means they're not good enough either. It means they didn't make the cut either. They're junior varsity. They're not good enough. And Jesus said, come follow me. And immediately they left their father, Zebedee's boat, and they came and followed Jesus. And everywhere Jesus went, this collection of anybody's followed him around. And why did Jesus choose who he chose? Because he came for anybody. He came for everybody. Not just the best of the best of the best of the best, but he came for whosoever will let him come. So this collection of not enoughs followed Jesus all over the countryside, learning what Jesus knew so they could do what Jesus did so they could be who Jesus was. And here is Jesus now looking at Peter and saying, Peter, I'm going to go away. All of this is going to be accomplished. What I came for, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to complete everything. Everything's going to be great. You'll see. But you know, when you're filled with pain, you, you don't, hear with normal ears. When you're filled with pain, you hear through ears of pain. And what Peter heard was not something wonderful. Not I'm going away and you're going to be filled with the Spirit and become a great preacher and leader in the kingdom of God. What Peter heard was, now I have nobody. Nobody thinks I'm special. Nobody takes time with me. I'm going to be the laughing stock of society because I followed somebody that's not even here anymore and died on a cross and suffered shame. 
And when Peter heard through those ears of pain, the, the hurt whisperer said, you're going to be a nobody again. You were a somebody. You were with him every time he did a miracle. People saw you. When he taught, people saw you. When he did what he did, everybody saw you, and you were a somebody. When he leaves, you're going to be a nobody because that's the pain that was in his hurt locker. This is how it affects our life. This is what it causes us to do. This is why the enemy takes advantage of that. This is why the enemy uh, violates us this way. Let, let me read you one passage, and we're going to say amen. But I want, I, want you to, I want you to see something that happens with Peter and Jesus and the rest of the disciples on the sea. And, and just watch this. Watch this. Verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And verse 25 says, and in the fourth watch, late, late, early, early morning, late, late, dark, spooky kind of time of day. In the fourth watch, Jesus comes walking on the water out to the disciples. Watch this. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. What is Peter thinking? You think you can walk on the water, Peter? I mean, this is his... Look, Jesus said, It's me. Guys, don't be afraid. And Peter immediately the first thing he says to Jesus is, hey, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come on out there to you, and I'll step out, and I'll start walking on the water. And so Jesus said to him, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Oh, my. Peter was doing it. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, I want you to see what Jesus said to him. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, I've always read that and I've always thought that it meant this. Jesus was looking at Peter sinking in the water. He grabs his hand and he pulls Peter up and he looks at Peter. And he says, Peter, you little faith, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? But Jesus wasn't sinking. It wasn't a question of doubting whether Jesus could walk on water because he was still standing on the water. What, what was the doubt all about? Well, the doubt was, I doubt myself. And when Peter began to doubt himself, he began to sink. I'm just saying that to say, why did Peter, the first thing he said to Jesus was, if that's you, let me come out there where you are. Well, it had everything to do with this rabbi and these teachers. You know, a rabbi taught people what he knew so they could do what he did so they could be what he was. And here's Peter, his first response when Jesus said, it's me. He said, well, you're walking on water. That means I can walk on water. I want to come on out there where you are because you teach me how to walk on water so I can do what you do so I can be what you be. And he jumped out of the boat and Jesus said, come on, man, come on. And then Peter starts walking out. And then when he starts seeing everything around him, he just starts going down. And Jesus says, oh, you have a little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt that you could do this? Why did you doubt that when I said come, you couldn't do what I said you could do? In other words, Peter was doubting himself. You know, I've been taught all my life that it's a wonderful thing for us to believe in God. 
But have you ever thought about the fact that God believes in you? That God, that God chooses you and he believes in you? And if he says, get out on that water and walk, then he only says that to us because he knows that we can do what he just asked us to do. And if we don't doubt ourselves, the opportunities are endless. The last thing the Lord said to us on this earth, or close to the last thing, he gave us a commission, and he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I believe in you is what Jesus was saying. You can do this, and we can't if we don't doubt ourselves because God doesn't.